I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of Truth. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these. Well, good morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, there's a Bible in the pew rack in front of you. Please take that as a gift from us and make that your own. Mark in it. Take it home. That is yours. Well, happy Memorial Weekend. Um, Here's the good news. It feels a little bit like a weekend to us. Uh, But God is still here, and God is still meeting his people, and God promises to move amongst us, especially through his word. And so don't take a vacation uh, in the pews, because God does have a word for us this morning, and if I'm honest, it's going to sting a little bit, okay? Uh, We're going to do a little bit of meddling. This spring, after Easter, we've been walking through a sermon series where we've been looking at the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, God's presence sent to us, indwelling within us, where Jesus said, it is better that I go away because you, in essence, will become the living temple. The heart of stone will be removed and you will be given a heart of flesh, the indwelling permanent Holy Spirit inside of you. It is for your good. And this morning, we're going to be looking at here in the book of Galatians, we're going to make one huge point, this tendency, this overall tendency within you and I, and that is that once we're saved, we still have a tendency (coughs) to run back to the law. (coughs) The language that he's going to use here for spirit, faith in the gospel, and freedom are all tied together in thought. That is, once you are saved, you are saved by the Spirit coming and giving you faith and opening your eyes and pointing you to the truth of who Jesus is and what he did on your behalf. That freedom, that is that you and I have this tendency to return to the flesh, to run back to self-righteousness and bondage. So listen as I read Galatians 3, 1 through 5. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? This is the only thing that I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun By the Spirit. Are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you, do it by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, We come to your word this morning needing to hear from you, needing conviction from your spirit to teach us and to remind us to comb through our lives and show examples of this overwhelming tendency for us to leave the ground that we have in the gospel, in the finished work of Christ And to run back to the law. To try and please you with our own righteousness. Father, would you teach us this morning? Would you allow us to see clearly through your word? Would you convict us? We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Can you imagine the vulnerability of the New Testament churches without having the New Testament Bible yet? I mean, here's Paul and Barnabas blazing a trail, preaching the gospel in areas that had never heard, right? That's what Paul said. He loved to go to brand new places. And their common practice was to go into a city and to enter into the synagogue, to begin with the Jews and to reason with them from God's word, which would be the Old Testament. And some would say, accept, but Most, the tendency was that they would reject. And then they would move to the market square and they would begin to preach the good news to Gentiles. And they were more successful with Gentiles and some would accept, but they were constantly raising up commotion in these areas. There there are people who would begin to persecute and attack. And you have this small church that would be birthed in these new towns. But commonly, there was so much opposition that Paul and Barnabas, they would stay as long as they could, but often they were run right out of town. And afterwards, there's the church sitting right for some charismatic false teacher to swoop in and to undo everything that was true to lead them off into a ditch. Now, that's exactly what happened in the churches in the region of Galatia. Galatia is a a region of Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. And Paul and Barnabas had gone through there. You can read about it in Acts 13 and 14. There was much opposition as they went through planting churches in this region. They were only able to stay for a relatively short period of time. And afterwards, after they left, in swooped what we now call the Judaizers. These opponents, Paul calls them opponents. He said they preached a false gospel, but you have to understand they were Jewish Christians in the fact that they believed in Jesus. But they believed that Jesus had come specifically to the Jewish people, and in order for Gentiles, that is anyone who is not Jewish, to be saved, they had to become Jewish, meaning hold to the Mosaic law and enter into all the customs, the Jewish customs. Now, the Old Testament laws that had become particularly prominent were the holiness or the cleanliness laws. This is a a complex series of regulations that were set up in the Mosaic law for worshipers to follow in order to be able to come into God's presence to worship him, to be acceptable in God's eyes to worship. One could not draw near if they had eaten unclean foods, or touched a dead thing, or if they had a disease, or if they had any bleeding from their body, including just a woman on her menstrual cycle. No, God had to be approached on certain festival days with strict guidelines about what sacrifices to bring and who could go where. Heavily involved was the Levitical priest, who was of particular descent, who wore particular clothes, who washed his hands and did things in a certain ritual way. Now, let me remind you, it was God who instituted all of these laws, signifying how he must be worshiped, saying that he is holy, And that sinful man cannot come into his presence without cleansing. But Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. He is how one is truly made clean. He is the only way to enter into God's presence. He is the only way that you can truly worship God. 
It's because of this that we see all through the New Testament that these Old Testament ceremonial worship laws, they get blown up. We no longer come by sacrifice. Jesus is the sacrifice. We no longer have to worship at a particular location at the temple in Jerusalem because Jesus came as the resurrected temple. And now his spirit indwells us, making us, wherever we gather, a living temple. We no longer have to come through the Levitical priesthood because Jesus came as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And he has made you and I a kingdom of priests. He is our high priest. We need no other mediator. We come with King Jesus as our high priest. You see, the law was a tutor in order to lead us to Christ. No longer do we say, do not touch, do not taste. You must worship on this day. You must have this mark on your body because Christ accomplished our cleansing before God. And this cleansing is given to you as a gift, simply by faith. Christ and Christ alone can make you clean before God. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. It's Jesus plus nothing, nothing to allow you to enter into God's presence. And these first two chapters in the book of Galatians, Paul has had an intensity, a passion. In fact, he is yelling, not at the Judaizers, at the church that he had planted. Because they so easily had left the freedom of Christ, the cleansing of Christ, Jesus plus nothing. They had left that position and had returned back to the law. Keeping certain commandments and mentally thinking that those commandments are what makes you right before a holy God. Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, that is, you are justified by faith, you began by placing your faith in Jesus, are you now being perfected by the flesh? That is how you walk life out as a Christian. Do we go back to the law of the flesh? And guys, this is where we need to camp out this morning because hear me, there is a tendency in all of us to leave the spirit and the freedom of the gospel and to run back to performance to the flesh and to self-righteousness. In fact, even the apostle Peter did. And if Peter did it, I promise you, you and I are just as susceptible. In Galatians 2, the previous chapter, Paul uses an illustration to tell the Galatians about how Peter stepped in this just the same. Peter was in Antioch. And in Antioch, Peter used to eat dinner or lunch with Gentiles. Now, Peter had a vision from the Lord telling him that all foods had been made clean. And so as they would, in, in Antioch, this is a, a predominantly Gentile city, Peter up there would eat with Gentiles, but suddenly some Jewish brothers from Jerusalem had come up to Antioch, and you know what Peter did? because of peer pressure, because of wanting to look holy, because of those things, because he knew that, oh, Jews don't eat that sort of food or sit at tables with people that do. Peter 
removes himself from his Gentile Christian brothers and begins to stand aloof, removed, comes with this group back here and they start to point fingers. It, 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 had, it had become so pervasive that everyone else followed Peter's lead as well. Even Barnabas was caught up back into it. And Paul says that I had to confront him to his face because he ran back to the law. So if Peter is not above it, I assure you, you and I are not above it either. Imagine with me your most perfect holy day in walking with Jesus. You woke up early. You read your Bible. You made it all the way through your prayer list. You sit down for breakfast and you lead your family through the devotional. You pray over your spouse and your kids. On your way to work, you are a patient driver. You are listening to worship music the whole time. At work, you excel. You've finished your project. Your boss is very pleased. And at lunch, the coworker that you have been praying for and witnessing to, you get to lead them to Christ. You come home. You help with the dishes. And catch this, the checkbook balances as you put your, your uh, monthly giving in the mail. When your head hits the pillow, you thank God for an amazing, perfect day. The next day, you oversleep your alarm. There is no time for the Bible or for prayer. And the house is filled with chaos. You snap at the kids. Why don't you guys have your stuff together? You know we have to do this every day. Why is your backpack not fixed? Breakfast is a rush. You even forget to kiss the family goodbye. And wouldn't you know it? Traffic. You honk and scream, gone is the patient driver. Your boss yells at you for being late and your coworkers know to stay away. You blow the big presentation and suddenly your job is in hot water. When you get home, there's an unexpected bill that had come in the mail. And now you don't just snap at the kids, you explode and storm off into the back room. When your head hits the pillow, you are angry at God for the absolute worst day. Now, let me ask you a question. This is very important. On which day is God happy towards you and the other day angry? Do we not have a tendency to think that God's disposition towards us on day two has changed? Come on, let's get real, church. Do you know the answer to the question? God can only and always see you through the lens of his son, Jesus Christ. And that he is 100% satisfied and delighted in his son. On both days, Jesus has paid for your sin. On both days, Jesus is your righteousness. On both days, Jesus has made you clean. On both days, you are God's child. And he views you as such. And his disposition towards you has never changed, nor will it ever change. And when you view it differently... Beloved, you are leaving the gospel and returning to self-righteousness. You are deserting the spirit and returning to the flesh. And as Paul exclaims, 
In Galatians 1, 6, at the very beginning, he says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him. Him. Did you hear that? It's personal to God. You are leaving him. If the father says that I am pleased with you because I have given my son for you, then for you to waver off of that is personal. For you to not forgive yourself and to carry that burden and to beat yourself up and make up your own penance, God takes that personal. He says, why did my son die? If you have to carry it around and beat yourself up, you see, you have left the gospel. Here he says, you've left walking with the spirit and the spirit will not meet you in your made up righteousness. We've talked this whole series about the The Spirit promises to meet you in certain locations and that you can go there and that you can rest assured that regardless of how you feel that day, that the Spirit is there, that he will anoint you, that he will bless you. But listen to me, the Spirit will not meet you in even good godly disciplines if you approach them to earn righteousness with God. All right, I'm talking to us now. You hear me? In my last church, you wouldn't believe how many college students uh, showed up when it was the week of finals. (laughs) Now, why do you think that is? They're hoping that God will help them do well if they go to church. Approaching a good thing, go to church, from the vantage point of works righteousness, God will bless me or show favor towards me because I have checked this box. Listen to me, that's leaving the gospel. The Spirit will not meet you there. Can I tell you another common time that believers leave the gospel? It's in times of trial and suffering. Because they view the trial as if God is punishing them for sin. I can tell you how many times I've had believers break down, weeping amidst deep pain, saying, I must have done something Wrong to allow God to let this happen. And in their heart, they respond with, if I pray more, if I read my Bible more, if I go to church more, then maybe God will bless me and make the trial stop. Beloved, hear me again. Hear me shout it. You already have every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. It is already yours. And that is the only location that the Spirit will meet you. He will not meet you in man-made righteousness, self-righteousness. He will only meet you as you come to him and open-handed and say, listen, listen, I have nothing to bring, but I come in the name of Jesus and I fully accept all that you have already given me because your word has declared in the gospel, I have every spiritual blessing. That's it. Anything else is to leave the gospel. He will not meet you. Now, there's one other common tendency that I want to point out in terms of how we leave leave the gospel, and that is to resort to legalism. I want to call these fence laws. Man-made laws. Think in Jesus' time, the uh, 
The Pharisees were, were great about coming up with fence laws. So a fence law is there is a truth back here, but I don't want to violate that truth. So I create a fence here that says, look, let's not even come close. So the commandment, do not work, okay? Do not work. The Pharisees had created tons of fence laws because if you actually think about it, you know, not working is kind of hard to define. So they put certain fences or legalistic rules that they had come up with, such as on the Sabbath day, you could not walk more than half a mile. Anything more than that would be considered work. Throwing something in the air and catching it, that's work. You could not take a bath on the Sabbath for fear that if you inadvertently spilled some water on the floor and then cleaned it up, you would be cleaning the floor and therefore you will have accidentally worked. See how this works. There is a truth back here, but someone comes up with a personal rule on how they want to interpret it. The reality is, is they're not thinking very well. They're not acknowledging it's very preference-driven, and instead, they become legalistic and self-righteous. So let me give you some modern-day examples. I've used this one before, but the famed British preacher David Martin Lloyd-Jones had a particular practice where when he would sing, he wanted to focus his heart and his attention on the words, and so they had hymnals, and he would, he would only keep his eyes down. He knew the songs forward and backwards. They were the same songs, right? And so, but he kept his eyes down and focused there. Well, you see, there's a truth there. That is that our worship should not be showy or about other people. Rather, it should just be about God. But it didn't take too long for the preacher boys who loved and adored him to adopt this same practice, and suddenly now you've created a culture of religious expression where they've ganged up and you begin to judge anyone else who doesn't worship in that particular way and say, no, 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 the way we worship is with our eyes down like this, and to do anything else is well, that's a sin. Well, that quickly becomes ridiculous, doesn't it? It was a correction for the ditch on this side of the road, but it's not thinking very well. And in reality, doesn't the scripture have a lot to say about worship? Isn't there other things about freedom of expression or joy, of being, of being able to delight in the Lord? Didn't David go before the ark with singing and dancing? Now, before I give other examples, I need to show you why this is so dangerous. You see, because Peter, out of fear of man abandoned the gospel in order to follow a cultural expression of holiness to fit in with his boys. And others followed suit, even Barnabas. Out of fear of man, wanting other people's approval, Paul uses that illustration because he actually lays the same blame at the feet of the Galatian church for why they followed the Judaizers. Because they wanted the approval of man and not God. Guys, culturally we do this all the time. When we pile on like those preacher boys and judge other cultural expressions through our own preferential lens, we get in our small group and we think the, the very same way. We accuse other people of sinning for our own preference. And Paul says it's not simply preference. 
You have left the freedom of the Holy Spirit. You have left the gospel and returned to the bondage of the flesh. He doesn't mince words one bit about it. At my last church, there was a big hubbub one week because suddenly the gigantic pulpit had been removed from the stage and replaced with a thin music stand. And oh, there was chatter. (laughs) And I pressed him, I asked the question, why does this matter? Now for most of them, it was simply because it's been there for 30 years and it matches the railing. But the best answer was this. Because the preached word of God is such an important aspect of church service, it must be approached with seriousness. Now you go, okay, there's a truth back there. But now that you state it, can we all agree that what the preacher stands behind actually makes no difference in the seriousness of the preached word and is simply a preference change. You see, without knowing it, preference had become law. And guys, I could list a hundred other examples about how Christian culture becomes legalistic. From the version of the Bible that you use to you don't love your kids unless you homeschool. But it's probably too easy for us to just list a bunch of legalistic things because, guys, I want us to get honest with our own hearts. Because I leave Jesus and run back to the law. My heart continually cares more about what other people think than what Jesus thinks. So one day I'm sitting down with a buddy and he starts talking to me about what God's been teaching him about giving. And he tells an incredible story about generosity. And I remember this conversation because it's one of those where I stopped listening to him And just began to think about what I was going to say next. Maybe you've been there. And can I just confess my pride that my thought was, do I have an impressive story about giving that I can say in return? I mean, after all, I'm a preacher. I've got to top this. Ever been there? I mean... There's no freedom there. That's a return to the law. If Jesus is happy with my giving, who cares what anyone else thinks? Guys, that's just one example in a million about how we value pleasing men and outperforming other Christians. We're like a hamster endlessly running on the wheel. And we exchange the spirit for running again in the flesh. We trade the work of the finish, the finished work of Christ back for bondage. And so this morning, hear me, Christ is calling us to freedom. Galatians 5.1, it was for freedom that Christ has set you free. Freedom doesn't mean that you can do whatever you want. It means freedom in relationship. Lane, my wife, loves me just as I am. I have to put on airs for you guys. I'm always on my best behavior when I'm around you. But when I am at home with her, I am completely myself. Warts and all. She knows the real me. And she chooses me. She wants to be with me, that's freedom. Not freedom to go break her trust or to mistreat her. No, it's freedom of relationship. 
Listen to me, believer, God has chosen you in Christ Jesus that you would have that freedom of relationship, that he calls you his own. You are his son or daughter. You are in the family, in the house. You are his own. And he has given his spirit to you so that you would abide in him. A woman was in a controlling marriage where where he kept her on a tight schedule. Everything had to be just right or he would yell at her. He never praised her, only criticized. She lived a nervous life under his constant prideful authority. Well, he passed away and she remarried a kind, gentle, loving man. However, the old life was hard to break. In kindness, he would say to her, you are free, my love. Everything in this house must be done in love. Day after day, he would come home from work, and in nervousness, she would apologize because dinner was not ready. In kindness, he would say to her, you are free, my love. Everything in this house must be done in love. But that didn't stop her guilt when the dishes piled up, or when his clothes weren't ironed. And in kindness, he would say to her, you are free, my love. Everything in this house must be done in love. But year after year, she continued to live in fear. And then one day, in an old shoebox, she came across a picture of her first husband. And it froze her in her tracks. She stood still in this moment, remembering, lamenting the years that she had sat in bondage, even realizing that she still was in bondage. And in a moment of crisis, as she held that picture, she could, for the first time here, The kind words of her new husband say, you are free, my love. Everything in this house must be done in love. And so in this critical moment, she made a decision. And she tore up his picture. And she began to believe, you know what? I am free. And suddenly... Every chore in the house looked completely different. The laundry was for her husband. The clean dishes were for her husband. And he came home that night, and dinner might have been a little late, but this time it didn't matter. And instead of nervously apologizing, she said, I am finally free. And everything that you see in this house has been done in love. Beloved, how many more years will you waste in bondage? How much longer will you serve Christ out of fear? Because the Spirit says it was for freedom that Christ set you free. Will you pray with me? King Jesus, we bow before you right now. And we say thank you. We say thank you for the price that you have paid to set us free. For the love that you have shown to us. And for the realization that in you, we have every spiritual blessing. And that there is no other ground that we can come before God Almighty. Father, forgive us. Forgive us for running back to the law. 
for running back to our own self-righteousness, for leaving the spirit that you have given to us for bondage in our flesh. Father, we know that it is only by being overwhelmed with the goodness of the gospel, only by seeing the greatness of the truth that all of my sin, past, present, and future, all of our sin has been nailed to the cross, that our hearts are flooded with joy, and that we walk in your freedom. Spirit, will you meet us there? Will you forgive us when we fall short? And will you remind us when we are tempted to run back? In Jesus' name we pray, amen.